I drive a uh, Toyota Camry. Clyde and I have driven Toyotas for uh, over uh, 20 years now, or almost 20 years at least, and they're, they're great cars. The car I have now is actually fairly new. It's only a couple of months old, but I've already learned that it gets uh, decent gas mileage. It can go over 300 miles on a, a normal tank of gas, and actually, if I'm uh, using driving mostly highway miles, it can go over 400 miles on a tank of gas. It's, it's really a fancy car. It's got gauges and knobs and stuff in it, and one of the gauges that it has is a gas gauge. And so it tells me how much gas is left uh, in my tank, and that's, that's a really helpful thing because I don't like to get gas until I need it. It's a matter of stewardship. You don't want to waste your time by going to the gas station more often than you ought to, and so I always wait until the gas gauge gets all the way down to the E before I get gas. And, and in fact, it's got this fancy little light that comes on that tells me that, that it's time to get gas. And I've learned that I can drive between 30 and 50 miles after that little light comes on. And so I always do that. I drive a ways after that little light, light comes on. I've been fortunate enough that we've never run out of gas in any of the Toyotas uh, that we've driven over the last uh, 20 years. It's been a long, long time, in fact, uh, since I've run out of gas. But I have come close a few times. It's just part of my nature, I guess. I remember when I was a sophomore at the University of Oklahoma that year, I traveled every weekend from Norman, where the university is, to Tulsa, which is my hometown, and I worked at a grocery store in Tulsa on the weekends to make some extra money. And so uh, I, I drove one Friday uh, from Norman to Tulsa, and I noticed as I got fairly close to Tulsa that the gas gauge on my 66 Mustang, which I really wish I still had, <coughs> the, was getting really close to empty. But I thought, you know, I, I think there's enough. And, and sure enough, I was right. There was enough. In fact, I would say there was exactly enough. Because as I got close to the gas station, the car started cutting out. And in fact, the engine stopped about a block before the, the grocery store. And there was a gas station right next to the grocery store. And so I was able to coast right into the gas station, right up to the, to the pump and stop right there at the pump. Now, you may think that's cutting it awfully close, but in my opinion, that's just perfect. I, I used every single drop of gas from that gas tank, and I didn't run out of gas, and I didn't have to walk and carry a can at all. So it was just actual, actually perfect use of a full tank of gas. I've, you've heard the phrase, running on empty before. And I guess you would say that's probably what my car was doing. Uh, for the last uh, few blocks, at least, it was running on empty. And you probably have a story or two that you could tell this morning as well about running on empty, or maybe actually even getting to the place where you ran out of gas and had to walk away. Unless you're one of those strange people that doesn't really know what a gas gauge is for and you fill up before it even hits half. <clears throat> Running on empty reminds me of what happens to many of us in our spiritual lives, too. I've been there a time or two. Probably you've been there as well. Running on empty. Still going through the motions, doing all the right things, the things you did before. Looking good from the outside, but the heart's not in the right place. You know that your heart is just empty. There's not really any deep connection with the Lord there. That describes where the church at Ephesus was when Jesus had John write that letter to them that's recorded in Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. They still looked good on the outside. Jesus said, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. They had good works. They were working hard to accomplish the things that God wanted them to accomplish. They were persevering. Things weren't always easy uh, for the church at Ephesus, but they continued to do the things that God wanted. They looked good on the outside, but then Jesus said, I have something against you. You have forsaken your first love, he says. Their heart wasn't right. Looked good on the outside, but inside they were running on empty. That's also the point that Jesus was making when he talked to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, the woman that he found at the well there in Sychar of Samaria. She talked about the place of worship because she was concerned about the external things. 
where it was that you had to worship, whether it was on Mount Gerizim, which is what the Samaritans taught, or in Jerusalem, which is what the Jews taught. She was concerned with where worship took place. She said, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. But Jesus wasn't concerned primarily about the place of worship. He wasn't concerned about the way things looked on the outside. Rather, Jesus was concerned about what was going on inside. Inside the Samaritan woman, inside other Samaritans, inside the Jews. He was concerned about what was going on in the hearts of the people around him. And so he told the woman, a time is coming and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God seeks worshipers. Now, he's not talking about seeking people who go through the right motions. He's not talking about people who show up at the right place at the right time. He's not talking about people who look good on the outside. God seeks worshipers. He seeks those who worship him from hearts that are right with him. He seeks those who worship him out of a heart that's full of love and devotion to him in spirit and in truth. And the reality is that when the church is running on empty, when our hearts are lethargic and lukewarm, when real heartfelt worship dies, that we're in a season of spiritual decline. And God longs to bring spiritual renewal where heartfelt worship will be restored. Our hearts will be on fire again. For the Lord. There are several seasons of biblical spiritual renewal that illustrate this key about renewal that when God brings spiritual renewal, He reignites the fires of authentic worship. Spiritual renewal under King Azza in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 shows a renewal of authentic worship that was a part of that season of renewal. When Azza gathered the people of Judah together, in repentance for the way that they'd strayed away from the Lord, they entered into a covenant then with Azza and with the Lord that they would seek the Lord. And when they entered into that covenant, the Scripture says they did so with their whole heart and with their whole soul. It was a time of sincerity, sincerely returning to the Lord, not just on the outside, but from what was going on on the inside. And, and so when they entered into this covenant of return, the Scripture says in 2 Chronicles 15, verses 14 and 15, they took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and with horns. All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and He was found by them. There was a restoration of heartfelt, authentic Worship. It was wholehearted worship. It was eager worship. It was worship with loud acclamation because it was coming out of the depths of their heart. Sincerity and joy marked that season of renewal. The spiritual renewal under King Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29 shows a similar renewal of authentic worship in that day. There had been this downward spiral away from the Lord under the three kings that preceded Hezekiah. <clears throat> but when Hezekiah ascended to the throne of Judah, he immediately began to bring the people of Judah back toward the Lord. And they responded to Hezekiah's leadership by repenting before the Lord for the way that they'd strayed away from him. After the temple had been purified by the priests, the people of Judah assembled together there at the temple in public repentance. And this is what the Bible says. Second Chronicles 29, verses 27 through 30. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar. And as the offering began, singing to the Lord also began, accompanied by trumpets and the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly bowed down in worship while the singers sang and the trumpeters played. And all this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. And when the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshiped. King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord 
with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and bowed their heads and worshipped. This was an amazing renewal of authentic worship in the days of Hezekiah. It was done with humility. They bowed their heads and they knelt down. It was done with joy. They lifted their voices in praise and singing to the Lord. In the time of Ezra, the same response of worship is seen during that season of renewal. Ezra brought the people back to the Lord. He reconstructed the temple and he dedicated that temple to the Lord. And the book of Ezra reports, in Ezra 6 verse 16, the people of Israel celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. Their hearts were full because God was restoring their relationship with him, marked by authentic worship. When the time of the Passover came, uh, came they made sacrifices during that feast. And, and the scripture says, for seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There was a renewal of joy, the joy of serving the Lord, the joy of worshiping the Lord. Their hearts were full because of what they saw God do among them. And you see it again in that same era in the book of Nehemiah. It records the latter days of the work of Ezra. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen, and then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. It was authentic worship, the raising of hand, the joy of expression, the bowing down in humility before the Lord. It was a season of spiritual renewal marked by a restoration of authentic worship. There are other periods in the Old Testament in which you see that same mark of of spiritual renewal. When God brings a season of spiritual renewal among his people, there is a restoration, a return to authentic worship, worship that comes out of the heart, not worship that is just in form, not worship that is just rote or just going through the motions, but it's worship that comes out of the heart, hearts filled with joy, hearts filled with gratitude, hearts filled with humility before the Lord. Many of the seasons of spiritual renewal that have occurred since the Old Testament days in in more modern era have that same mark, that same key to spiritual renewal, a a restoration of authentic worship. During the days of Savonarola, in the renewal that occurred from 1496 to 1498, one of the characteristics of that renewal was hymn singing. They started singing hymns, not just in churches, Small groups of Christians would gather together and they would walk through the streets of the town singing hymns to God. There was a restoration of authentic worship that could not be contained just on Sunday morning, that could not be contained just inside the church buildings. It broke out into the streets. During the spiritual renewal of the Reformation in the days of John and Charles Wesley, many great hymns were written that are still sung in churches across the world today. God was doing something new. It was a season of renewal, and one of the marks of that season of renewal was that God was doing something new in worship. And so a lot of new songs were written. And they were written in the music of the day. Popular music was used. As they wrote these songs of of praise and worship to God, new expressions of worship came out of that era of the Reformation. Now, I know you and I consider them the old hymns. Those are the old traditional hymns that we enjoy singing because they are so rich in what they say. But you know how they viewed them? The church viewed them? Those who weren't experiencing spiritual renewal? You know how they viewed them in that era? That was the new music. It wasn't appropriate for church. They had church music. They didn't need new music in the church. They wanted to use the old music, which we don't use anymore. We use what was new music then that we consider old music now because it was a restoration of authentic worship. And one of the marks was that this new expression of worship in the hymns that are so meaningful uh, broke out in that day. George Whitefield wrote uh, during the Wesleyan revival what would be repeated over and over among uh, those whose lives God was touching with new life. He said, had I a thousand tongues, I'm sorry, a thousand hands, I would employ them all. I want a thousand tongues with which to praise him. 
They just didn't have enough ways or enough words to express all that was going on in their hearts. There was a restoration of authentic worship. So let me talk today about four characteristics of authentic worship. <clears throat> because spiritual renewal is a return to a right relationship with God. And a return to a right relationship with God includes a return to right worship. Hearts that are full of gratitude and love and joy toward the Lord express that gratitude and love and joy in authentic worship that comes from the heart. Probably the best example of authentic worship that we could find is King David, known for generations for the worship that he did to the Lord. And so let's look at some of the things that characterize David's worship as, and see them as keys or characteristics of authentic worship. One is, when worship is not an event or a specific kind of activity, but instead worship that is life. It's not just what you do on Sunday morning. It's not just what you do in a church service. It's what you do with your life. That's authentic worship. David wrote in Psalm 89, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. Worship wasn't an activity for David. It was a walk or a lifestyle. It was the ongoing characteristic of every moment of his life lived in the presence of the Lord. Paul affirmed that worship is not something that just happens in a meeting place dedicated to him at a particular time when we gather together for that purpose, but that rather worship is something that characterizes the entire life that we live. And so Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy, because of all that God has done for us, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. What's your act of worship? Not singing. I mean, singing can be an act of worship, but not just singing. It's not just what goes on in the church service. It's offering all of ourselves, our whole body, our whole life to the Lord. That is our spiritual act of worship. Authentic worship means presenting our lives to God and living our lives in His presence. The worship God desires is the offering of our bodies to Him, our whole life to Him as a sacrifice. So can you see how that connects to spiritual renewal? What if God brought every Christian in the Corvallis and Philomath area to the condition of, of repentance and surrender to Him that caused all all of us to be committed to a life of worship, a life lived in the presence of God, a life lived as a sacrifice to God. What if we all said with absolute sincerity, Lord, today, today I am yours. Wherever I go, whoever I see, whatever I do, I give those opportunities to you. Today I am absolutely yours. Whatever happens, Lord, I want my life to be a praise and an honor to you. If every Christian in the Corvallis Philomath area lived like that, it would make a huge difference to what goes on in the culture around us. If worship is to be like David's, it'll be a way, a way of life, a willing and daily sacrifice of everything about our lives to God. Oh God, renew that kind of worship in our day, in our place in our lives. Restore authentic worship. Second characteristic of authentic worship is worship that is uncompromising. There was nothing halfway or stingy in David's worship. When David worshiped the Lord, he gave it all to God. It was wholeheartedly and everything that that meant. David's praise was so lavish that there was one time he got so caught up in expressing praise to God that he danced around Jerusalem says uh, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 14, David wearing a linen ephod, that's his undergarments, David wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all of his might. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do that here. But that's how, how full of worship David got. He, he expressed his worship to God by throwing off his outer garments to unencumber himself, and then he danced before the Lord in front of all the people just 
wearing his ephod. He made a, such a spectacle of himself that he embarrassed his wife. And when he got home, she laid in to him for how he had embarrassed her. Her name was Michael. And uh, he sa- she says to him, How can the king of Israel, how has the king of Israel distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would? And this is how David responded to Michael's criticism. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father. Michael was Saul's daughter. Rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. What David was saying to Michael is, I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. What I'm doing is for the Lord. And I only care about what I'm expressing to the Lord. That's authentic worship. I call that worshiping with abandon. He abandoned his pride. He abandoned his reputation. He abandoned what people thought of him. Out of the fullness of his heart, he lifted his whole life in praise to God and didn't care about what anybody around him thought about him. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't hold anything back. That's right worship. Uncompromising worship. Oh God, renew that kind of worship in our day, in our place, in our lives. Help us to stop being so concerned about what the people around us think. People, even in church, who are supposed to be Christian. Help us not to be concerned about what they think about us. And instead, just lift our voices and our lives to you in praise that comes out of the honesty of our hearts, expressing how deeply we love you. Renew that worship in our day. A third characteristic of authentic worship is worship that witnesses to others. David wasn't afraid, he wasn't ashamed to worship so that other people could see him. And when they saw him, they sat up and took note. Psalm 57, verse 9, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. He let people see him worship. Psalm 40, verse 3, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. David let people see him worship. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Now, I know he's talking about the kind of death he was going to die. I know he was talking about being lifted up from the earth on the cross. And when he was lifted up on the cross, he drew men to him because they saw the extent of his love. But the principle is true in every aspect as we lift Jesus up so that people can really see him and really see what he's like and really see how much he loves them and really see how much he's done for us. Then people will be drawn to Jesus. When we lift up our own talents, when we lift up our our own expressions, when we lift up our own lives, that doesn't draw people to Jesus. When we lift up Jesus, That's what draws people to him. And that's what David was doing. Lifting up God so that those around him could see and be drawn to God. Years ago, Tommy Coombs was a musician. He was in a secular rock band called Love Song. One day, he and several members of the band decided they were going to go to church. They didn't do that often. And so they went to church in a Southern California church called uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Costa Mesa, where Chuck Smith preached. And not long after that first exposure to the gospel, Coombs and two of his band members came into a relationship with the Lord. They became Christians. And this is what Tommy said about what he saw in that first visit that he made to Calvary Chapel. He said the worship and the singing were really touching. The melodies were pretty, a little old-fashioned, but they were very warm, and and it made me feel good to sing them. My main impression was that these people, catch this, my main impression was that these people really knew who God was. 
I sensed God was there. In their simple little worship songs, I sensed God in their midst. And that's what real worship is to do to unbelievers. In every generation, worship has a a tendency to degenerate into just rituals and forms. Spiritual renewal, renewal brings new life to the church and a renewal of right worship through which people, even unbelievers, sense God's presence, that God is there. Oh God, renew that kind of worship in our day, in our place, in our lives. Worship that doesn't help people see how good a singer as we are, how well we play the piano or the guitar, or how well we move to the beat of the music, or how pretty the words are that we say or sing. God, renew worship that when people see it, even those who don't know you, they will sense your presence. Be drawn to you. A fourth characteristic of authentic worship is worship that is unequivocally the top priority of our lives. David wrote in Psalm 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, one thing I ask of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. That was David's greatest desire. His greatest desire was simply to be with God, just to worship Him. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in Samaria, he told her the kind of people that God is seeking. He did not say, God is seeking evangelists. Although evangelists are critically important for the spreading of the gospel. He didn't say, God is seeking preachers. Although I think preaching is fairly important to what God wants to accomplish in the world. He didn't say, God is seeking people to help others, servers. Although serving others reflects God's heart, but that's not what he said. He said, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is seeking worshipers. Peter listed the positions to which God has raised his people. He says in 1 Peter 2, For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. God has done great things for us. He has exalted us to high positions that that are reflective of of His mark in our lives. We are God's chosen people. We are priests before our God. We are a holy nation made holy by what God has done for us. But you know why He's done those things? Peter says it. That you may declare the praises of Him. He's done all those things so that we could worship Him. It's the number one thing God wants from us. So it should be the top priority of our lives. In the absolute honesty and sincerity of our heart to express our joy and our gratitude and our praise to the great God who has done such marvelous things for us. Oh God, renew that kind of worship in our day. Worship that comes out of hearts that are full of love for you. Hearts that understand what you've done for us and and express honest joy to you. Hearts that understand who you are and are filled with praise for who you are. Do you know what one of the main activities is going to be for us in heaven? Yeah, you guessed it. It's going to be worship. In the vision granted to him of heaven, the apostle John saw four living creatures around uh, God's throne, and he said to them, he said of them, rather, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Day and night, they never stopped praising God. And around the four creatures were 24 elders representing the All the people of God from the Old Testament and all the people of God from the New Testament era. And and then of them, John said, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. So here's the question. Do you know when the 24 elders, that is all the people of God, 
do that kind of worshiping? Revelation 4, verse 9. Whenever the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne. And when do the four living creatures give thanks and honor and glory to God? Day and night. They never stop saying, holy, holy, holy. They never stop worshiping. And when we get to heaven, neither will we. So let's start here. <laughs> let's start doing what we'll, we'll be consumed with in heaven. Honestly expressing our joy for what God has done for us. Honestly expressing the love that we have for God. Honestly expressing praise for who God is. Oh God, renew worship in our day, in our place, in our lives. Bring spiritual renewal. Bring a, a freshness to our worship so that our worship will be characterized by more than just what we do for a short period of time once a week. That it will be the mark of our whole lives offered as sacrifices to you. So it won't hold anything back, but offer to you uncompromising worship, even if that means people wonder what's going on in our lives and we're humiliated by it. Help us to abandon ourselves to your praise. Help us to offer a worship to you that is the top priority of our lives. Renew worship in our day. In Jesus' name.